we have taught you about branding, branding ourselves, branding our businesses. We have been talking to you about managing people, especially in difficult times. I think we saw, um, we just came out of COVID and it was not easy to manage people. We spoke to you about financial management and also about customer experience. Now today I am very, very excited because we are talking about the legal obligation that we as entrepreneurs have. Ben. This is to ensure that we are running our businesses in an efficient way. And we stop that story of Makanjo. Makanjo wanakuja, biashara. Today we are going to learn what we need to do and not do to ensure that our doors are open for business. I'm very excited to introduce our guest for today. Jane Batia. She is the managing partner at KM and M Advocates. She's got a wealth of knowledge and experience in the legal field, in corporate, in corporate law. She has got experience locally and internationally. And I don't think any introduction I do would be able to do her justice. Her accolades are just a lot. We thank you, Jane, for this opportunity because we are happy that you're talking to us and there is no fee note coming at the end of this conversation. So we are much obliged and we truly, truly appreciate you. Now we are going to listen to Jane and thereafter we shall open a question and answer session. We'll be putting up our questions in our chat and I will take you through that. My name is Anastasia Karaoke from Springboard Capital. Today we will have some exciting gifts. It is the new year and Springboard Capital is going to be gifting us to be giving us nice giveaways so that we can be able to start the year with a lot of excitement and a lot of focus. I will not labor, belabor the topic today. So allow me to introduce our guest, Jane Batia. Over to you, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know that everybody can see me. Uh, at least the introduction has been done. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with all of you. And it's a pleasure for me to give you a few tips on the, the legalities around uh, doing business, the pitfalls and the minefields that you need to avoid. So we'll get on with it. We'll have a few slides. And then after the slides, I'll go through the slides. I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. Once we go through the slides, then you can have a Q&A section and then you can ask your questions. Thank you. So I'll share this, the screen now and then we can start immediately and go to the, the slides. Great. I'm sure you can all see the first slide. Here's the second one. Can I share the second? Yes. Great. I think the first slide has come through. So we are going to go through the slides one by one. And, and of course, I'll interject as we go along just to give you an explanation. I'll start with the one, one thing that we really need to get out of the way. You are all in business. You're in the business of making money. That's your core business. You're going to commercial, uh, uh, you're going to commercial uh, enterprise, you know, industrial professional activities to make money. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that you, you stick to your core business of making money. And that's why we are going to give you the tips so you can make your profit, you can look up for your customers, you can sell your innovations, you can use the resources in the best way possible, you can display your talent make, through your services and making goods. And you can, of, of course, of course, the most important after all that is adoption of fair trade practices. That is what you should focus on. So this presentation is basically to get you through so that all these other legalities and compliance issues are out of your way and you're left to do what you're meant to do, making money. That's why you do business. So the issue is this, what do you, you need to be aware of the rules for conducting business. There's no way you can, when you go out to do any business, you must be aware of what you need to do, how you need to go about it, yeah? So sometimes most people imagine that if you're going to business, you don't need to consult legal advice, you don't need to consult lawyers, you know, to do your business. And sometimes people get into the pitfalls because they don't have that information. And of course, there's also this perception that lawyers are expensive or legal counsel is expensive, but that is not always the case. So it's always important to look for those partnerships 
with lawyers or with other professionals, even accountants and HR personnel who you can grow together. Even if you're a startup, even if you're a middle-sized business, it doesn't matter. Just get into those partnerships that can help you through your initial stages of uh, running your business so that you avoid the many issues that can come after for failure to comply with certain things. Yeah. So in terms of, in terms of again, contracting, the same thing applies. Apart from the regulations, you need to go into proper contracts at the beginning of your businesses. Whenever you sit down, make sure you have the right contracts done so that you're able to enjoy the benefits that come with those things. If it's a contract, you need to ensure that you're well protected. Yeah. So you need to know what are you entitled for? What are you entitled to do? In terms of recovery of debt, I know that's also another big problem. Uh, there's, there's this issue that, of course, if you go to court, it may be very expensive to debt collect. It's not always the case. In fact, now, there are, as I'll show you later, there are other there are things that the, the, there are new laws that have come into place, the small courts, claims courts that are there in place, which you don't even require lawyers. But that will come at the, at the end of the presentation. So this is what I was talking about. So there are a few stages you have to go through. You've set up your business, you need to register. Under registration, there are those regulations that fall under registration. Whether you are doing a registration for a business or for a company, then you need to do the registration. I'll go into that later. Then there's the operational side. Again, operations is you're complying with the regulations now. This is the core business. What are you, what you need to comply with? Then there's a third section where you need to deal with the issues of payment. This is the taxes, the licenses, and all those costs that, are, that go along with compliance. Those are the three stages. So why do regulations exist? Why don't we just have people going out into business and doing whatever they want? Obviously, you know, it's, that cannot work. That can will be the law of the jungle, every man for himself. So we have uh, regulations because there are minimum stand standards that the government has to set, yeah? For people to be able to do business fairly and equitably. So the same rules apply we assume there's a level playing field. There's no undercutting. Of course, that's another story for another day. We know there's always undercutting, whether it's in price or it's in professional services. But the rules of the game are meant to be clear to protect, of course, the businesses from unfair practices and also to protect the public. So it's important that we have regulations. Other is to be the law of the jungle. Kila mutu nabiake, you do whatever you want. Yeah. So it's important that all entrepreneurs are aware of those rules to ensure that they know what they're getting into, they know what rules they have to comply with. And of course, the trade must be conducive for economic development. Obviously, apart from that, there's the issues of uh, when you're in business, you have employees. So the employees' rights are very, very key in, in any business. You must ensure that those rights are protected. You don't want to be in court every day where you're being sued by your employees You've not provided them with the right uh, contracts. Your contracts are not fair. You know, you people are being fired on the spot. Others through SMSs. I hear there are people who fire others through SMSs with no due process. And of course, at the end of the day, you end up uh, paying very, very heavily for those uh, for those mistakes. Then there's the issue of public health and safety. Even in a business where you you are in manufacturing, for instance, and we are you have poisonous emissions or you're, you're dealing with uh, consumable foods and all that, it's important that the public health and safety is protected. So there are going to be rules and regulations. There are many laws, even for, for public health, there are many laws that you have to comply with, but it depends on what business you are in. So your business will determine how many regulations you have to comply with. And that's why as, as we go ahead, we'll, we'll see how best can you be able to, to keep track of those laws that you're meant to comply with. You are not, and as I said, you are not in that business. So what do you need to do? I'll come to that later. Obviously, the other thing, regulations are there to protect the environment. Again, depends on the business you are in. If you're in manufacturing and you're polluting the whole city, people are getting sick, it cannot be allowed. It can't be business as usual. You can't have business at the expense of health of the public and yourselves and your employees. That has to be protected. And that's where the government comes into and steps into that. Obviously, the last one, I can hear a lot of noise at the background. Maybe it's mine. The last one we have there is the issue of tax. Maximization of tax revenue. 
obviously the, the, the only way one way the government can be able to collect revenue is through regulations. There has to be regulations, there's the Finance Act, there's the tax laws and all that that ensure that government is able to, to collect revenue from all businesses. Obviously you can't have a, for, of course, other, the other social, social infrastructural needs. So now we come to the core. When you are registering a business, there, of course, that's the most important step that any business has to take. And I'm sure most of you are already there. You already have registered your businesses. But I will just recap on this just to, to share with those who may be in the early stages. So your business venture is the one which determines the kind of business you, you how you're going to register your business. It can be, so there's the small businesses, there's the medium size, there's the large businesses. There are startups, there are people who start up or young people coming from school, they want to start a business. They maybe feel they don't have enough capital, they just want to have a business name and they start trading. Then obviously there's a company, so you can set it up through a company and the advantage and of course disadvantages of both. If you're in a professional, if you're a professional, you can go into a, pro, a partnership. Like I have a partnership in my law firm, you can have what we call also limited partnerships. Those could be more or less dealt with in terms of the professionals. The professionals are the ones who usually go into partnerships and limited partnerships. Now, there are, of course, the advantages of each, and uh, I will not go too details in that, but to suffice to say that in view of what has been happening recently, and in view of the way the company's law has been amended and changed, and the way we are doing business today, it is no longer very difficult for anybody to incorporate a company. You can do it even online. You don't even have to come to lawyers like us. You can do it on your own. You go to eCitizen. You go to the business registration service section. You, you state, you, you book your name, you reserve a name. Uh, and then once you reserve a name, they even have the model company, the model articles of association you can select. So the process has been made very, very easy. It is one of the ways of the government is trying to encourage people to do business so that you don't have to have the, that expense of hiring a lawyer the way it used to be before you come to us, maybe the fee is too high, that has really been cut off. So it's, there's no reason why you can't even incorporate a business as a company and not necessarily as a business name. Obviously the reason is that if you have a company, your scope of growth is more. The compliance may be high, but the scope in terms of borrowing, you're able to borrow a company, you're protected as, a, as an individual, you know it's a separate legal entity. That means that as a company, no one can sue you directly, no one can come for your direct assets. If you own that little piece of land you were given, or you, you inherited, or you have bought through a hard earned mortgage, no one can come for that. It shelters you from that. They must first go to the company because they're a separate legal entity. Whereas if it's a business name, yourself and your business are one and the same thing. So your risk in terms of uh, obligations is much higher. So it is always encouraged that if it's possible, incorporate a company. It shelters you from yourself, from your personal assets and the company assets. So that is one of the key advantages of a company. Uh, in terms of uh, partnerships, I, I will not go much into that. Again, the partnership is more or less like a business name where that each partner is responsible or they are held jointly liable for any liabilities. Whereas a limited liability company, of course, they are, it's, it's more or less each partner is liable for whatever actions they take. So that is it in terms of the, the, the business registration. And of course, the acts are there. I've shown you the acts below where I put the ones you need to comply with. Uh, so this is quite straightforward. And if you need any help, this one is you can get any assistance from any advocate, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I've mentioned something about the Companies Act. And the reason why I, I, this the Companies Act is so important because it's the one which sets out how a company should be managed and governed. And that's the most important thing that you have to do as a, as a business. How do you manage your company? How do you set your systems and processes to ensure that you are compliant? How do you uh, have it? Do, do you have all your procedures, your, your, your policies in place to ensure that you're complying with what you need to comply with in terms of employment, in terms of company, company law, your directors, are they compliant and all that. So the company act can be quite tedious. It's a lot of stuff in there. But again, it sets out all the legal obligations, all the legal 
obligations and uh, the legal compliance issues that you need to deal with. It helps you understand uh, the compliance uh, checklist easily. It sets out everything. So this has been really simplified in the new legislation. And in terms of companies that what we can do, depending on the size of your company, you don't have to be able to interpret the whole company, uh, the companies act on your own. What you can do is probably, as I said earlier, partner with a law firm, and then we can agree on, uh, on what you need to, on a retainer that they're able to do your audit checklist from time to time, maybe once a year, they're able to advise you on a need basis. So that way you are able to feel clear and sure that you're in compliance. You don't need to wait for the, the end of the year and find out that you have uh, incurred penalties. Get a good accountant, for instance, make sure your annual the returns are done in time, your monthly returns are done on time, the PE, the statutory deductions, the VAT is all done in time. In that way, your post as you as you already know most of you, then you don't have to face any penalties. Yeah, it becomes a lot easier. For those that can, of course, as you grow bigger, you can even get an in-house in legal advisor to do that. Nowadays, I mean, we have got so many lawyers in the market, there's, there's opportunity for you to, to tap into that. Yeah, so you can get an in-house lawyer who will be able to do your annual audits. So this is just a precaution, take care. If the, if the, the Companies Act is simple yet complex, get the right partnerships, I've already talked about that, and try to ensure that you stay away from the hassle or the stress of compliance. The other issue is uh, the issues of taxes and licenses. You, may, you need to make sure that you pay what is required and give what is required. And I've mentioned this the, the, in terms of the taxes, you all know about annual income taxes and the, the PAE and what else I've talked about, NHF, those are statutory. So task, the taxes especially are risky, there are many penalties, so you want to avoid that. Obviously, as you know, in this period of time, especially with the kind of uh, issues we are having, uh, we know the government is out there trying to collect as many taxes as possible. So this is not the time to be on the wrong, wrong side of the law. Make sure your taxes are paid on time. Avoid the hassles, avoid diversions on these issues. You don't want to be diverted. You don't want the city council people come, even for licensing, coming, knocking on your door and harassing you. This is not the time you want that. Keep them away, just pay up in good time. Yeah. You don't want your businesses closed. Sometimes you see Kanjus walking around. Even around here, they'll just be walking and they'll say, do you have a license for your billboard? If you don't have your license, that's a lot of trouble. So just get your things and your licenses in place. The other issue that pulls back businesses, and I've talked about it previously, is employment, employees. This is one issue that there's a big problem with this even for government workers and of course private sector and the best way to deal with this is just get in terms of operations get somebody to draft for you standard agreements yeah standard template for especially for employees standard agreements get those in place any lawyer can draft that any hr person can draft that and they can comply with the employment act once you have this within your own business just make sure that you have a, a, a resource person, whether it's an administrator, they're able to use the same template for all your new employees. They must sign those templates. They're in compliance. If they need any other documents again, get the templates, get a HR policy template, yeah, from either your HR person or a resource person or a legal professional. Get that in place. So, and then of course, have those reviewed periodically. Yeah. So once you do that, then you know that the issues of employment, the contracts are all in place. Uh, the issues of all other policies should also be done, whether there's grievance policies, the whole works. It's a whole spe spectrum of policies. Just have that done and have it in, in, your, in, your, in your company. You don't need to call out a lawyer every time, come and draft for me an employment contract. That is not necessary, it's, and it's expensive. So you don't need to do that. I've talked about health and safety laws. I won't repeat that. It's quite clear. The most, the other matter we need to talk about is intellectual property. As a company, as a business, okay. your IP is your value. It's your wealth. You must protect it. 
there are a lot of businesses that start. People have very good innovations, good ideas. We've heard of very young people who have beautiful ideas. They work for corporations. They give the IP to the corporations. They are not protected. And the corporations run away with it. Yeah. So it can be it can be very, very disastrous. So you lose it, you have no claim, it's not registered. So it is important, even as a business, whatever innovations you make, especially the people in innovations, you know, you're developing products, you're developing systems, you're developing systems, IP issues, technology, you must make sure that you protect your IP. Yeah. And the way to protect it, of course, there are various ways. Even if you're in the, the entertainment industry, you need to copyright, copyright your music, copyright whatever else you're doing. Even if it's in writing books, the authors, copyright whatever you have. That is your wealth. And of course, there, there are various uh, legislations. We know how to do it. We, uh, uh, an agent can do that for you. You can go to the Kenya Industrial Property Authority. You can have them register it for you, whether you have a lawyer or not, they can guide you. You can go to their website. It's called Kipi. You can go to their website and you can see what you need to do. The charges are all stipulated. If you feel you need the, any assistance, then you can look for a lawyer who is a, an agent, a patent agent as well, and have them registered. It's quite, it's, it's quite administrative and it's quite clear and it can be done. So make sure you protect every IP that you have. Seek, a, seek opinion, seek advice and find out, is it, can it be protected? Don't assume that is all you have, that is your wealth. It can take you very, very far, of course. Mm -hmm. So what are the benefits of, uh, the benefits of regulations, yeah? Or compliance, rather. What is the benefit of complying? Why don't you not just ignore the, the laws and go ahead? Obviously, there'll be lawsuits, yeah? If you don't comply, there, there's a possibility that somebody will sue you for infringement probably you're, you're, you're infringing on somebody else's rights. They have an IP you didn't know, you, you go ahead and just copy, you could be sued. Your business could be shut down if you've not paid your licenses, if you're not paying your taxes, it can be shut down. The issues of operations and safety, it's important to comply for safety reasons, I've talked about that. And obviously compliance makes, means that people trust, are happy and trust, to, trust your company and are happy to deal with you. If you have a reputation that you, you don't comply with laws, you, you take shortcuts, you don't uh, honor your obligations, if you're in contracts and all that, if you don't do that, then you have a reputation of risk. No one wants to deal with you and your business cannot grow, obviously. Then obviously within your culture, within your, uh, within your company or business, there'll be a culture of compliance. So anybody who works for that business knows that you have to comply with the law, we have to be sure that what we're doing is stipulated for, it's the right thing to do. And it gives, and of course that gives integrity to that organization. I know integrity is in, in short supply in today's day and age, but it's important that we have that integrity. And obviously compliance also protects uh, the integrity of your business data. Yeah, so you're complying. So whatever information you have, it's well placed, it's well kept, it's stored and retained for future use. I've talked about the way, how do you survive the legal minefield? Yeah. So what you're saying is that a lot of these problems you can avoid if you know what it is that you need to avoid. So compliance is not an option. If you are the CEO of a company, if you are the operations manager, if you are the HR person, whoever you are, make sure that you conduct a legal compliance audit. This can be done quarterly or annually. And a, a legal compliance audit, of course, what you have is what we call a checklist. So you have a checklist of all the issues that you need to deal with. You start with the issues of licenses, you start the issues of uh, tax, uh, tax law, what have I done, what needs to be done. So you have a whole checklist, the appointments, what, how has it been done, the employees, have they been appointed in terms of the law? Have they been, if there's a grievance process has it been followed? So it's a compliance checklist that has to be set out and it's reviewed every year. And then of course, once you do that, again, we've talked about the, the issues of penalties and fines, you avoid all that, yeah? 
and I've talked about the legal compli compliance uh, audits to be done frequently. I've talked about how to stay on top of regulations. Generally, I've said to appoint a legal or accounting professionals as a compliance officer. They don't have to be in-house. They can be external with a good uh, working relationship. You can agree on fees or retainer, you know, which is quite affordable depending on the kind of partnerships you're seeking. Yeah, so there are a lot of people out here who are willing to stay to stick with their businesses from the time they start to the time they go into big corporations. We have done that. I've seen some of my clients. We started when they were very, very small. And today I'm proud when I walk around and I see big billboards advertising. They've grown way over. So it's it's a pleasure for, for us in pro professionals who are out here to deal with businesses from the beginning to the end. And from the when they are very uh, small in the initial stages of their growth to the, 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 the of course, the the time that they become quite a uh, corporation uh, to reckon with, we're happy to do that. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, standardization, I've talked about standardize a lot of documents using legal advice, standardize them and have them in-house. You don't need to consult lawyers all the time. That is for contracts and agreements. Make sure you, you have them run through a, a, a lawyer. Don't sign unless it's already approved, don't sign until you have somebody run through them or have an in-house uh, attorney or lawyer to look at them. And of course, the last part there about insurance, issues of liability are big. It's always important to have insurance depending on the kind of business you are in. If you are a professional, obviously you have a professional indemnity cover. If you're in the business of, uh, if you're running a factory, there are always insurances that you need to have in place. Those are basic operation things that you need to do to mitigate your risk. Yeah, liability. I've talked about data, secu data security. You need to have good records in your company. Keep your records together. Have somebody who makes sure that all the records are kept properly. It doesn't have to be in hard copy. It can be electronic. Make sure everything is scanned and placed in, in a folder, you know, online or somewhere that can be accessible to the right people. This is important, of course, for future, for continuity, when people leave the organization, you want to make sure that you understand what was the last stage, what did we do last? Had we paid our annual, had we filed our annual returns? Had we paid the licenses? Had we done X, Y, Z? So you need to make sure that all those documents are comprehensively reserved and placed in the right place for, for future references. Then there will come, there are some new laws that have come that may affect your businesses. Recently, we have heard about the Business Law Amendment Act. That's the latest that has come in. Uh, and in fact, I think yesterday or today was meant to be the last day that you file these returns. Unfortunately, the, the extension has, an extension has been made to 30th of June. So what this means is that for those of you who are running companies, businesses, which are incorporated as companies, you're meant to disclose the ownership and the beneficial ownership owners of that company with more than 10% equity within the business. This has come about because of the, the issue of the concern about uh, international money laundering. People are having businesses, they're having proxies, you don't even know who the business belongs to, money is changing hands. So as a way to curb that, and, and of course criminal activities, there's a lot of criminal activities that's going on. So you see people with money, you don't know where the money comes from. They are all over town. You never seen them working. You don't know where their businesses are. You've never heard they have a company, but they have money. Obviously the, the government, like all governments in the world are trying to, curb, to, to crack down on that. So this is one way the Kenyan government is trying to do that. I think to avoid those scenarios. So they're trying to say, okay, fine, you have a business. If there are any proxies, you have to, be, you have to declare that. If you don't declare them, and money changes hands. The question would be, how come you are not declared as a beneficiary? How come you have X amount of money flowing from this business or this business to that person? How does that happen? And if they suspect, any suspect business doing that, of course, the government has a right to go to court and uh, seek a way of exposing that, yeah? 
or declaring that that person who is a beneficial in, uh, beneficial owner and is not uh, disclosed, they have not ever received or become part of that company. So it's a way of letting, making sure that people who are hiding behind proxies, hiding and receiving money and, and having these companies which are faceless are brought out, are brought out, yeah. In, because to curb those issues of money laundering. So if you have a business, this can be done. You don't need the, actually a lawyer to do this. You can go to your e-citizen account, uh, log into the business registration service, go in and you'll be guided. It, actually, it's very clear. It shows you what you need to do if you're a director. That is okay. If you're a shareholder, you disclose all your shareholders and put their information in that, in the, in the system. So I don't think there's any charge for that, for this particular one. Is just go to your e-citizen and do it. Comply because the fine is very punitive. They're saying that if you don't disclose, you'll be fined 500,000. Yeah, which is half a million. Very punitive. Not sure how practical it will be, but I think it's a deterrent. No one wants to be fighting about, I can pay or I can't pay. You don't want to be going to court to fight about that. So you'd rather comply and avoid the hassle, yeah? So this is important and this one has to be done by everybody who owns a business and uh, Companies Act. For, for the ones registered under the business names, you don't have to do that. I, this is not a compliance issue. And that's why we say, of course, the company, once you're registered, registered as a company, the compliance issues are a lot more than a business name, because that's just a trade name that you're going to use. In terms of uh, the issue of uh, recovery, I, I didn't talk much about that. I know a lot of businesses have an issue of debts. You, you supply goods or you supply, or you give a service, and people don't pay, yeah? And they don't pay, the, the, it's, a, it's a clear case. I, get, I, I supplied you the goods, you didn't pay, I need my 500,000 now. They don't pay. So most small businesses or medium-sized businesses are reluctant to pursue these matters or to seek legal remedy for this because they say maybe the cost of seeking the legal remedy, the cost of lawyers would be a lot more than even what you're trying to recover. You know, the time spent, you don't know when the, the hearings will come through our courts have not been famous for being efficient. Sorry to say that there's been a slow, slow process. So most people are put off and they don't want to go to court. So they, they lose money. Yeah. So they lose a lot of revenue. Somebody owes 50,000, 100,000, 200,000. But what has happened is now we have the small uh, claims court. They are yet to be, I think they'll be operational. They've been there, but it's been the, the new law which protects, which gives at least a higher pecuniary jurisdiction for the amounts of money you can collect under the small claims court has now increased from 100 to 1 million. So that's quite a large scope, yeah? So what it means here is that you can go to this small claims court. Uh, you don't need a lawyer to go here. You can even go to court and orally make a claim. You can even speak in your own mother tongue. You don't have to speak in English, yeah? Quite, quite very, it's a very liberal kind of thing, which is very good for our people. And this will have a a footprint across the country. So you go there, you have a small claim against Jane. You say she owes me a two million, two hundred thousand. I want it. These are my documents. This is the, the proof that I have. And the magistrate will just make a determination immediately. The only times you can adjourn these matters in a small claims court is you can only adjourn them three times. Meaning these things, this story of matters lasting in court for five years, two years, people hiding files. You can't find the files, they've been hidden, they are lost. It will not happen. So this is a good thing for small businesses and medium-sized business, and for everybody, not even small businesses. I mean, a hundred times, there's a lot of people, even in big business, where people don't pay you a lot of money, up to a million. Many of them, cumulatively, becomes quite a lot of money. So it's a good avenue to deal with the issues of debt recovery. Because obviously that, of course, will go back to improve your bottom line in terms of your revenues. Uh, so I don't think there's, uh, you may have, of course, a lot of questions, but let me just say that uh, regulations, of course, are double-edged, as we have said, they are good and bad. They are good, good in the sense that they keep everybody in check, bad in quote, in terms of uh, if you fail to follow the rules, then there is a lot of uh, compliance issues in terms of penalties and fines and all those other things we've talked about, which could mess up with your business, yeah, the growth of your business. Uh, regulations are not static, they change with time. Uh, the political tide, of course, also influences them. Some of the laws you'll see 
sometimes you look at a law and you think, okay, this one seems to be directed at something. Because every law, there's always a reason, there's always a rationale. And laws are there to react to the social dynamics happening at the time. So every time there's something happening and you, 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 there's a mischief in society, the government will always come out and say, okay, what do we need to do to arrest this mischief? And that's why laws exist. So laws are always changing, regulations are always changing. Yeah. So they, they are not static. And then, uh, of course, we say safety is not an accident. It is planned. And legal compliance fosters sustainability and success of our business. So plan your compliance. It will not come on its own. You have to plan it. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. It's nice. Yeah, it's time now for the Q&A. I don't know whether I've been able to add any value, <laughs> but uh, let's have the Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jane. Legal compliance fosters business success. I think that's the biggest take for us today. Mm -hmm. Amazing presentation. Thank you very much, Jane. Mm -hmm. In respect of time, we've got several questions coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Modoni. Thank you, Modoni, for your question. Now, Modoni is asking, and this is what is typical for our businesses. Mm -hmm. um, for those that businesses that are in operational and they are paying salaries, but these salaries are not above the taxable amount, mm -hmm. which is typically most Kenyan businesses. Is it necessary to register these businesses with K these uh, uh, payments, the salaries with KRA? Well, I don't know. I'm sure you have a, a good accountant, but I would imagine that you should, you should register, even if you're not, because uh, isn't it a, a compliance issue that uh, if you are running a business, even if you're making uh, whatever returns you're making, it's a, even if they're nil returns, then you should be able to to register that. Yeah, just as a compliance issue, you are saying that they are there. We are not paying, but these are our staff, but they are under the, the threshold but a good accountant can be able to advise on that, yeah. Thank you. I think for Modoni, the word is compliance. So just do mm. it for the sake of compliance. Yeah. Um, v, what is the required annual revenue for one to apply for VAT? And what, when is one required to register for VAT? Uh, I, the amount of the, the, the threshold for VAT, I don't know that it's 5 million. I'd have to check that. I'm not a tax expert per se, but a good, if you consult an accountant or even if you call KRA, they'll tell you there's a threshold which should be above, I think, 5 million revenue for you to be qualified to register for VAT. If you don't have, if you don't have that, you should not register. Yeah, because once you register for VAT, that means you, every month you must make your returns. And if you fail to make those returns, it's a penalty. I would imagine the penalty, I think, is 10,000 shillings for every month that you don't comply. So it piles up very quickly. So before you apply, make sure that you've reached the threshold. Of course, uh, it's better to err on the, uh, you know, on the point of not registration than to err on registering and then finding out that you are below the threshold. Because then you are, your compliance uh, requirement goes up immediately. And if you don't comply, if you don't have somebody who is able to, to put in, uh, to, to, to to write to the carrier and tell them that it should be dormant because you're not within the threshold, then you'll continue to pay the 10,000 every month. Yeah. Fantastic. Modoni, I believe your questions have been answered. Feel free to write on the chat if anything requires clarification. Now, Julie is asking about the intellectual property. Is it mm -hmm. possible that someone can have it uh, on their info or brand or data without it being public information for purposes of avoiding legal issues and infringement of that? The question is not clear. I don't know what she means. Have it on their, are you By talking data, about? I'm thinking in the social media. Yes. So when they have their, uh, their IP as their brand, how then yes. does it not become public information and so that it cannot be used? And somebody oh, no, no. And, and unfortunately, that one, they would have to use it for you to know. Yeah, of course, what when what happens once you register your brand, there's what you write there as trademark. There's usually a small sign TM, isn't it? You've seen the round, the, the initial trademark. 
on any brand name, for instance, yeah? So that is meant to be a warning that that, that brand is trademarked, it's registered, that's your IP. If anybody copies that, of course, then you have recourse. You can file a claim against them because you've already indicated it's TM, it's trademarked. You've got that right over, you have got that claim over that IP. So they should not use it. But there's no other way of you selling, there's no other way of you telling people, don't do it. No, all you have to do is to put your trademark sign, if it's a trademark, if it's a brand, and that's it. If they do go ahead and use it, then you have a claim against them. Fantastic. So Julie, for you, trademark is the word. We must trademark what we own. Thank you very much. Henry um, is asking, nowadays the issue of lifting the veil in relation to sorting company problems is often done. When can it be legally done and does it dilute the advantages of a company and what risks are posed when one is a silent director or shareholder? Okay. I'll start with the last one about the silent director. Silent, not director, it's mainly silent shareholder, yeah? Because if you're a shareholder, unless you're a shareholder director. The risk now we have seen, now in terms of the new regulation, now that should not be there. And ideally, if you're complying, the, the issue of silent director will no longer be there, legally. Of course, that if it, it may have continued to happen, of course, yeah? when people don't comply. Because what now the new law is saying is that we don't have the silent director, quiet uh, directors who are not known, faceless directors or, or shareholders, especially shareholders, because now you have to, to disclose, yeah? But the risk, the risk of uh, the, the shareholder who is silent, between in terms of the company, what happens is that of course you have a proxy. So the proxy is there to protect your interest. Yeah, so in terms of the running of the corporation, there's no risk because the proxy acts on your behalf. Yeah, so there's no real risk in that regard. Yeah. Uh, yes. What was the other part of? Ahead and, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the other section? The first one was on lifting the veil in relation to sorting company problems. Yes, lifting the veil has been an issue in, in company law for very, very many years. Of course, the whole issue of uh, incorporation was to now protect that. So lifting the veil goes counter the whole idea of incorporation, which makes a company a legal entity on its own. It's very rare, it's very few cases, in, even in the recent past of lifting the veil. It can be done, but it's a very onerous process in terms of the evidence that you have to show evidence. We all know about the case. I mean, if, I don't know that the person asking is a lawyer, but uh, with the, the case of Solomon versus Solomon, whereby even the court held that that company was a separate legal entity from the man Solomon, even though his family and himself owned all the shares. Yeah. And they even borrowed using the company. They even got a debenture over the company assets. And it was ruled then, and I'm yet to to hear about the, the lifting of the bill, to get a, a good case that has successfully done that. And it was true that it's a separate legal entity. You cannot, Solomon and the company were two separate entities. So that rule is the most courts will be very, very reluctant to lift the veil of incorporation. Because then it, it, means, it means that the, what then is the point of incorporation? Yeah. So it's, it's always been a very difficult area. Uh, I'm sure most judges, most courts are very reluctant to do that, yeah. Because then it, it, okay. it, it kill, kills the, the whole essence of a separate legal entity. Okay. So I guess to answer Henry, it does dilute the advantage of a company. Yes, it would. It would okay. completely dilute it. Because the company is meant to be that protection. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Henry goes ahead and says, thank you for that wonderful presentation, Jane. It really is a wonderful presentation. Please shed a bit of light on the difference between a business name and a company in terms of suitability. Oh, good. Yes, a business name, what I was trying to explain that at the beginning of the presentation, a business name is simply that. I'm Jane Batia trading as Batia and somebody. Yeah. So it means that the business name and myself as a sole proprietor, and usually business names there, you can have, uh, although you can have more than two, 
they become now partners within a business, yeah? It's not separate from the person, yeah? So the disadvantage of a business name or the, the advantage is one, very little to comply with. You start a business immediately, you reserve a name, you get a name, off you go, you're ready to start your business. No memorandums, no articles, just start your business, yeah? So it's a, it's a very simple way of commencement of any business at the early stages. Of course, you can convert that later into a company. In terms of a company, of course, there's a, the regulations, as I've said, it's a lot more or uh, onerous, uh, setting up memo and articles. There's a corporate governance structure issues, you know, that you have to deal with. So obviously, it depends on what level you are in, in terms of the business you're setting up. What kind of business are you setting up? Are you setting a business where you want to go to the bank and borrow? If you want to go to, is it a, to the bank and borrow, or if you want to talk to Springboard, for instance, they, they lend you some money, then they would prefer, it's preferable that you, you, you have a, a company. It's always preferable, yeah? Because the rules of a company are easy to, 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 to monitor and track than a business name, yeah? I don't know whether that was the question or what else was part of that question. You're on mute, Anastasia. Anastasia, you're mute. My apologies. Yes, that was a good answer. I think it has okay. covered, but uh, Henry will confirm it otherwise. Lucy is asking, she registered a company in 2018, but she has not been in operation. Should she continue to do nil returns for NSSF, NHIF, and KRA? There has been no operation and no staff. Yes, please, please do that. I actually had a client of mine who did that as well. I mean, that, that happens so often. You say, okay, my company is not running, so what am I bothering this for? Do your returns uh, so that at least you're on the right side of the law. Do it. I did it. Uh, I had a client who used to do it, then they stopped running that company, but they never registered that. So four years down the line, they're getting an issue from KRA that they've not been compliant. They have a penalty of X amount of money, NSSF and HIF, the statutory returns, the same thing, they had employees, or you close down. So you have to do the returns. Either you do the, return, you do the returns and if possible, then you can close down the company officially, if you're not going to use it again. But as so long as you keep it up, up, uh, open, you've not uh, closed the company, or then you need to file your returns. It's safer to be, be safe than sorry. Absolutely. Best to be safe than sorry. Because of time, yeah. I think the last question we'll take. Kindly expound on arbitration as a legal recourse for breach of contract, and whether mm -hmm. this falls under the small claims court in some way. And how does one plug into arbitration as a legal recourse? So in yeah, that's a very good question. Arbitration actually is the way of the future. We are all being encouraged to go for arbitration. It's, a, it's, a, it's recognized you have the Arbitration Act of Kenya. So it's, it's a legal structure that is established by law. So what happens that in terms of contracting, and it's very, it's very well utilized in contracting. So what you need to do in any contract that you have, as a matter of course, you must have a clause that you shall go for arbitration as a first point, as a, as a dispute resolution mechanism, yeah? So what we usually have, we have mediation. In, in that contract, we'll say we'll first have mediation. So mediation can be between the parties, maybe a CEO of two companies, they come together, they, they talk about it with their officers and say, okay, let's resolve this. If that fails, now you go for arbitration, yeah? And you've provided for it, yeah, under the contract. Let it be provided for in the contract. When it's two pages contract, one of the clauses should be arbitration. So arbitration means that you, you get, a, and of course you stipulate how you want it to happen. So what usually happens is that each of the parties allowed, you, are, you are, can agree on an arbitrator, a single arbitrator, recognized uh, by the Arbitration Institute of Kenya. There's an arbitration institute we have here in Kenya. And most of the arbitrators, you don't even need to be a lawyer to be an arbitrator, by the way. It, it can be even a, an, a, an architect, an engineer. You can also, even any other profession can be an arbitrator. So what usually happens, there are those issues, if it's a construction matter, for instance, and there are construction issues, the person who will be best 
the best person to arbitrate would be a person with a background in construction, an engineer, for instance, or an architect. Yeah, and all those are members of the Arbitration Association of Kenya, the Institute of Arbitrators. There are many of them. Then there are many other matters where lawyers would be the best to do it, but a lot of arbitrators are well versed in the process. The process is not as rigorous as in court. The filings are not as rigorous. The, you know, the legal jargon is not as much. You know, it's very clearly much about the business transactions, how do we need to resolve it? So that one you can tap into it. In, in every way, and it's the best way actually to, to manage matters other than a full-fledged litigation. And the act, if you go to the Arbitration Act of, uh, of Kenya, just go and Google it, look through it, read through it. And then uh, if you need any assistance, go to the Arbitration Institute of Kenya. They can even give you advice on how you can go about it. We have people manning that at this, uh, institute. So it could be quite useful, but it's a good way and a good thing to do. I don't know whether I've answered. Great. Yes, question. you have. You really, really have answered. Yes, you have. Thank you so much. I think uh, we, like we say, this has been very informative. And the fact that we are getting this free of charge, we can't take that for granted. And we totally, totally appreciate you, Jane. And we appreciate okay. everybody who has been here. Now, I promised people goodies. I promised some goodies for the new year. And uh, we were talking about legal matters. Don't worry, Jane, your goodies might come. <laughs> you are being promoted. <laughs> so I promised, uh, we are talking about legal matters. So I had intended to gift somebody whose name starts with L. I've had two people. There's Lucy Mungatia and Lucy Minor. So I'll be getting in touch with you so that L for legal, we shall be able to remember and associate Springboard oh. with that. Mm -hmm. We had a first person who logged in very early and we appreciate you in January for keeping time. Uh, his name is Edwin, 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 yes. So Edwin Mungatia, Ed, no, Edwin Mohatia. Edwin, we are going to be awarding you. We shall be getting in touch with you. We appreciate everybody who has been here. We wanted to ensure that within this one hour, we do not spend a minute of extra of your time. And so we thank you so much for taking your time. Springboard Capital is a lending institution. We come in and lend all your finances to improve your businesses, to ensure you get your assets. Why Springboard Capital? Springboard Capital is flexible. We don't just give you a particular um, product for you to intake. We ensure that we are giving you and we are talking about you as a person and your business. We structure our solutions based on you as an individual and your business. We individualize your borrowing and we give you flexible repayment options. We are here for you. We listen to you. We give you amazing, amazing customer experience and we promise that we shall be there for your business. We are the lending hand. And we thank you so much for being with us. Should you want to see these and more of our webinars that have been happening, please go to our YouTube page. These two shall be running up and you can be able to go back to it and remind yourself uh, what we've talked about. Our Facebook page, Instagram and, and um, Twitter, they're all on and we've been broadcasting these live. Also, please feel free to visit our our website, www.springboardcapital.co.ke. We've got our blogs on there and we've got this. We are going to also upload this discussion. Once again, Jane, thank you. We are humbled and we appreciate you. You're welcome. Let me put it, uh, you're welcome. Asante sana. I have a question. How do we get in touch with Jane? Uh, should we need to get in touch with Jane to give us more advice on this? Maybe the, yes, uh, contact on the chat so that, uh, that the members on the page can get in touch for any queries yes. or any services. Great. Let us, we are yeah. posting Jane's contacts on the chat yeah. so that we can be able to know. And like we said, she's a managing partner at KM and M Advocates giving you free legal advice today. Tomorrow, you will get a fee note for it. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Nice chatting to everybody. Thank you from Springboard Capital, the lending hand. Have a good afternoon, everybody, and a great year ahead. Stay out of trouble, stay compliant.